So after each one, I'll send a link to the recording to everybody registered for this. So um, tonight is the start of the inaugural, hopefully the last virtual curriculum we do here at UVA. Uh, my name is Winston Guathman, the program director. Um, and we're gonna try and keep this fun. We have 18 uh, students from outside UVA registered for this course. And then we have a handful of the UVA students here as well. I also wanna welcome a lot of my residents and faculty who are gonna take part in these talks over the course of the next uh, nine weeks or eight, nine weeks or so. Um, so just real, real quickly, I uh, just wanna say welcome from our program leadership. Um, again, I'm the program director. I've been doing this for a year now. Um, I was the associate program director before. Uh, my chair, Bobby Chabra, is kind of who drives our program, um, and he's going to say some words tonight at some point. He's got a lot of different meetings he has to attend to, but he'll stop by at some point tonight and say hello. And then my associate residency director, Keith Bachman, who's absolutely fantastic, has been working uh, side by side with me over the past year trying to work on this. And so clearly we're in kind of unprecedented times uh, from a standpoint of education, and my goal at UVA is to continue the educational format as best I can. I've been trying to welcome uh, both our, you know, our medical students and residents who are associated with our program as well as students outside our program uh, to come and learn about UVA and learn about orthopedics. And one thing about us is that we love what we do. And I hope that we can convey that charisma and enthusiasm for orthopedics to you over the course of this. So who am I? Um, I am, uh, again, I'm sports medicine trained faculty since 2013 here at UVA. I've been the head program director since July 2019. I took it for Rashard Dacus, my partner. Um, I was the associate program director underneath Dr. Dacus from 2015 to 2019. So I've been in some, some form of this role for the past five years. I grew up in Virginia, went to UVA for college and medical school at EVMS. I did my residency at UVA, and so I have a pretty good idea of how this program works. I've been a resident here, and then I, was, I came back on faculty. So I think that perspective to me was helpful so that I could understand kind of what the, the average resident goes through. And, and I think that I can bring that experience um, to be a good program director. Uh, Dr. Bachman uh, did, res did residency at Cleveland Clinic. And so he brings an outside perspective. I think that's been really helpful as well. I did a sports medicine fellowship at, at uh, MGH up in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, and then I did a second fellowship in hip preservation uh, with Thomas Bird in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, when I was recruited back here on faculty, Dr. Chabra was very kind to bring me back, but he said I had to fill a niche that we didn't have, and hip arthroscopy was that niche. And so I've been really happy to, to be a part of that here at UVA. I've also been one of the team doctors for both UVA and James Madison since, I've, uh, since I started here on faculty. That's also been really gratifying and rewarding. Um, Possibly most importantly, I, I do have a, a family who um, supports me. My wife, Kelly, is a neurologist at VCU, and then I have uh, two children, Kate and Robert. So who are we? Uh, this is a picture of our department. Um, we have 30 clinical faculty members in seven divisions. And so uh, each division kind of represents a different subspecialty with orthopedics. And that's kind of how we've, how we've set up our department within these divisions. We have full-time research faculty. We also have a full-time contingency of faculty in, in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, uh, which is down about two hours south of us, uh, which is a really good place for our residents to go and train as well. Um, we have, uh, we take five residents per year on average, so we have 25 residents currently in the program. Uh, we have a handful of fellowships, which I think actually uh, bolster our training program because you get to meet and, and uh, talk with uh, fellows who are from outside the program and talk about their experience as well. Uh, we have a slew of physician's assistants and nurse practitioners. Uh, over the course of 2019, we had 8,400 surgical cases, so a lot of volume here at UVA. So just to go through our different divisions, this is our adult reconstruction faculty. Uh, Dr. James Brown, Dr. Thomas Brown, Dr. Kwan John Kui uh, pretty much take care of all the complex hip and uh, knee replacements in, in, in the center part of the state. Uh, a really outstanding experience with, these, uh, with this group. Uh, the foot and ankle faculty, we have uh, Dr. Vincat Paramal and Joseph Park, as well as Truett Cooper. Uh, Chef Hurwitz is faculty emeritus, uh, again, another, uh, another outstanding division. And I think what you'll see as I go through the different divisions, we just have a great breadth of faculty here from, uh, who came from all over the place who really bring a lot of, uh, of good perspective to our program. <clears throat> our hand upper extremity faculty, Rashard Dacus, he was a former program director, now the vice chair for physician wellness and diversity. Bobby Chabra, our chair, Nicole Deal and Aaron Freilich. Our orthopedic trauma faculty, Dr. Seth Yarbrough and David Weiss, 
Uh, we're adding one of our chief residents from last year, the outstanding Michael Hadid, will be coming back to join us in, in 2021. We're very excited to bring him back on board. Our pediatric orthopedics faculty, Leanne Lather, who's a pediatrician who helps out with our non-operative uh, care, Mark Abel, Keith Bachman, the associate program director, and Mark Romness. And then our spine faculty. So we have Hamid Hassanzada, Joshua Lee, Frank Shin, Adam Scheimer, and Anu Singla. Um, really high level thinkers in the, in the world of spine, producing a lot of really great research. And finally, probably the best division in my mind since it's the sports medicine division, but my partner, Mark Miller, Steve Brockmeyer, David Deduck, Brian Warner, and myself. Um, and so that rounds out our seven divisions. We also have an oncologist, Dr. Greg Donaldson, who comes up from VCU and helps us out with our, with our uh, tumor cases. So the lifeblood of our program is our residents. Um, we have 25 residents, and honestly, I think most of the faculty would agree that the reason why we do what we do is because of this group of men and women who, you know, every single day they challenge us and, and, and make it really a whole lot of fun. So our PGY-5 class are chiefs. So we have Dennis uh, Chen, who's going to do an adult reconstructive uh, fellowship at Florida. We have Trent Gauss, who's uh, uh, going to do a hand fellowship at Pittsburgh. Max Hoggard, trauma at Greenville. Michelle Q will be doing sports at HSS, and Eric Larson is going to be doing hand at UCSF. Um, these are our, our chiefs. I just uh, they just came into this role. I'm really excited about this class, who kind of sets the culture. Uh, one thing that Dr. Bachman, and Dr. Chaba, and myself like to do is is pretty much give the chief residents uh, class the ability to kind of run the show in our program, and instill their culture and instill a lot of their philosophies. And so our curriculum, as you'll see it, and a lot of what we do from a standpoint of the residency will kind of come down through our chiefs. Our PGY4 class, we have Francis, Matt, Nicole, Emmanuel, and Barris. They're all trying to figure out their fellowships right now. It's actually interesting as a PD watching this crew come up through the ranks. And now the PGY4 class is up next as far as fellowship match. And so Francis is going to hand, Matt will be going into sports, I hope. Uh, Nicole and adult reconstruction, Emmanuel will be doing adult reconstruction, and then Barris is doing hand. Our PGY3 class is a six person class. Uh, Ian Backlund, James Burgess, Zach Burnett, Tim Lancaster, David Noble, and Kara Thorne. They just survived their PGY2 year, and so they're pretty excited. You can see the big smiles they have on their faces. To be honest, that's the smile they have in their interns. During the dark times of PGY2, they might not have big, that big of a smile. I see Matt DC has joined us in this video, and then he turned it off. Good to see you, Matt. Uh, and then our PGY2 class, Alyssa Altoff, Neil Blanchard, Pearson Gein, and Thomas Moran. They just finished up their intern year. And then finally, the class we just matched, uh, he just joined us here in June in really unprecedented times. So Richard uh, Campbell from Penn, Lawala Barn from Illinois, Chicago, uh, Monica LaPointe, now Monica Arner from Michigan State, Eliza Pellerin from Minnesota, and then Jeff Ruland. Uh, this group will go down in history as the group that came in during COVID. So uh, their match day obviously was, uh, was not quite as exciting as others because they, uh, they're all stuck in quarantine and their graduation was obviously different, but very excited to have our intern class here. And perhaps the guy who really makes the, uh, who stirs the drink, if you will, David Craig, our residency coordinator. David's been side by side with me for the past four years now. And really honestly, I would put him head to head against any coordinator in the country as far as his level of organization, enthusiasm, engagement. This guy just bleeds the program. And as a resident here, you'll find out just how wonderful it is to have a great residency coordinator. So where are we? I mean, Charlottesville, a lot of, I see a lot of folks uh, on this roster um, from all over the country, some people as far away as California. Um, this is Charlottesville. We're a small town in central Virginia. And so the thing about Charlottesville that makes it so cool here, we are circled. It's a small town, but it's got some big town features. University of Virginia is here. There's a lot of sophistication and, and academic pursuits here. Uh, a lot of history here as well, the home of several US presidents. Um, and again, I think you'll find that it's a, it's, a, it's a small town, a lot of big features. Um, during the course of this virtual curriculum, our residents are going to go through some different, different elements of our, of our resident life. And one of them will be just the city of Charlottesville and things to do here. Washington, D.C. is about two hours to our northeast. Uh, so it's not too bad to get up to their nation's capital. Um, although you do have to wade through Northern Virginia to get there, which can be a little bit problematic from a traffic standpoint. The beach is about three hours away. I think today it was 92 degrees here in Charlottesville, so I'm sure a lot of our residents were dreaming about being in the ocean. Roanoke, you know, the other place where we, we send our residents is about two hours to our southwest, although I think some residents can make it under an hour and 30 minutes, I've heard, uh, at least that's what the police have told me. 
Uh, we also have skiing close by. If global warming doesn't take too big of a hit on, on our you know, winter greens about 45 minutes away, it's a great place for patients to come from because it's a lot of ice and a lot of inexperienced skiers and so a lot of distal radius fractures. So again, this is a beautiful city. This is the downtown mall looking at it from above. It's a, it's a pedestrian mall with a lot of good restaurants, a lot of good music. Uh, as you can see off in the distance, there's the UVA hospital, um, which is off, off toward the sunset, about a mile and a half away from downtown. So it's actually all pretty, pretty, uh, pretty compact here. Here's another picture of Charles looking at it from the side. And here you can see the University of Virginia Hospital. Um, and you'll see this actually really closely associated with the university. There's University Rotunda, which is the undergraduate campus. Um, and so again, it's a beautiful place to live. Um, looking more closely at the actual hospital, here's our hospital campus here. Um, this is actually a pretty new picture because yeah, as you can see the, uh, the new bed tower being built. Uh, it's a 612 bed level one trauma center, but we're undergoing expansion now that will make it uh, be able to accommodate more people. Um, it's been the number one hospital in Virginia for the past four years by US News and World Report. Serves an area of probably over 2 million people. You know, you were a small, we're a small town, but we're amidst a, a very large catchment population. So we bring people in from Northern Virginia, from the North Carolina border, from West Virginia. And again, we have this, this uh, recent uh, bed tower expansion, as you can see in this picture here, we have a brand new emergency room um, where our patients can come through. And then uh, we're gonna have a, a whole orthopedic floor on this. Now COVID has kind of slowed down the progress as far as how this is gonna be implemented. Um, and so we, have, uh, we haven't quite gotten in there quite as uh, uh, like we want to, but hopefully once this pandemic ends, this will be our new home. So Roanoke, as we talked about, here's the, uh, it's about, uh, an hour and 45 minutes to the southwest of us, a beautiful city. Actually, it's actually larger than Charlottesville and the hospital is larger as well. We spend about 40 weeks there over the course of uh, our PGY3 and PGY4 year, but we get to experience a brand new set of faculty, you know, 30 different faculty there, a real good taste of private practice, a ton of trauma. I mean, these residents will, will come back having nailed uh, and have done you know, 50 femur nails over the course of the rotation. They have free housing there or subsidized housing and gym membership. And again, they sometimes call it surgical boot camp just by virtue of how many cases you're doing per block down there. A really great experience. And, and uh, I think a lot of residents would talk about how much they like the experience down there. Um, really excited to announce that we're building a brand new musculoskeletal center at Ivy Mountain. Uh, this is so cool. We're gonna spend an entire session on it in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is also called the Chabra Center. Or Bobby Chabra, our chair, really put this uh, uh, put this together, and it's going to be basically a, a home for all of orthopedics as well as musculoskeletal medicine. Um, very excited about this. There'll be a lot of residency educational initiatives there as well. So, who are you? Um, what happened? I a lot of you all uh, uh, reached out to us through VSAS or applied or, or came through uh, another way to to come with UVA. The lifeblood of our program has been our medical students for a long time. If you look at our current roster of, of residents, 22 out of 25 are visiting medical students at some point. And so this year is obviously going to be a very different year for us. And so we're very excited that all of you are here. Um, if you're on this call and you'll see your name on this list, email me because I might not have you registered. I want to make sure I have everybody on here registered because I really am interested in who you are and where you're coming from and why you're interested in UVA. We also have some UVA students who are interested in orthopedics going through the same process as you. And as, as a faculty mentor to these students, I'm very aware of what's going on right now. And I wanna be very, um, uh, I wanna be an advocate and a guide for anybody interested in orthopedics and how they're gonna get their, their selves into a, uh, a residency match for next year. Um, we have five spots in our program, but uh, I think everybody around the country is in the same place and same boat right now. And so hopefully your advisors are giving you some good guidance as far as what you need to be doing in order to get your uh, application ready for uh, September. So just a quick intro to the virtual curriculum. This is a brainchild of our faculty and our residents. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that we were able to expose you all to UVA and everything we had to offer here. Um, we have two discrete sessions, each comprising nine talks. A lot of you all have signed up for both sessions. Honestly, I don't, I'm not gonna keep track of who comes to 18 sessions. I just want this to be an exposure to UVA and want to be able to meet some people virtually. Um, this will probably evolve over the course of each, each time. I want to get some interaction. I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do it. I don't want to just randomly call out on people because I think that'd be kind of, uh, I wouldn't say malignant, but it, it might put you in a bad spot. Um, but uh, the, the objective is just to introduce you guys to UVA and, and cover a variety of different topics. Again, we all love what we do, and I think it's going to come across in the, the talks that we do tonight. So each time we're going to have, uh, each evening we're going to start with a resident life talk. 
uh, current residents kind of give just a perspective about UVA. Uh, and then we're gonna do a, a case and an orthopedic to topic given by one of our faculty. The goal being that you get to meet our faculty and hear kind of what their academic uh, interests are and what their educational uh, perspective is. Over the course of uh, the nine weeks, every division we have will be featured. Again, we hope to keep it informal, interactive, and fun. And I would encourage feedback to me I want people to tell me what we could do better, how we could make it more interactive. If you want to, you know, have a different type of session, let me know. I'm, I'm flexible. At the very end, we will have a resident panel just so you guys can um, uh, can maybe just ask questions of our residents. I won't be there. You can talk as much as you want. I won't record it. Uh, but hopefully our residents can give you a pretty good idea of what we're up against here, okay? Uh, so with that, uh, this is the uh, the actual curriculum. I've emailed this out to everybody. Um, the, the orange is the first the, is the first curriculum. As you can see, we'll go through each topic and each um, orthopedic topic over the course of nine weeks. Again, not going to be comprehensive. Hopefully, keep it fun. Keep it kind of medical student um, or organized, and so that it's not too hopefully not too over your head. Um, I'm going to bore you to death with FAI tonight, but that's what I that's my passion. So you have to listen to me, um, and hopefully we'll have some fun. So. Um, Again, thank you for joining us as a crew. Back when you could have parties, this is a party we had at my house a couple of, uh, last year. Um, more recent parties, if we don't get that close together. These, these pictures always kind of give me the heebie-jeebies that we're ever actually that close to each other at one point. But um, hopefully one day we'll get to that point again. I see Matt's wearing his mask because he's trying to socially distance from us. So um, so I don't know, Bobby Chabra, are you out there? Uh, he is the busiest man in all of, in all of Charles. So the guy basically has a million different things he likes to do. Um, I see a lot of our residents are on and we'll have a panel with you later, Max and Matt, and, and Ian's going to do a case. Keith, do you have any comments? So Keith no, just, Hi, let me get my video going so that you guys can there see who go. I am here. There you go. Uh, I just want to welcome head, everybody. Headset. headset, going old school. Check this thing out. I have a microphone. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to get the entire microphone set up out. So, And you may get some cameos from my oldest kid here. Um, but I just want to welcome everybody, and um, and uh, I think you know we're going to try to highlight our program as best we can, uh, see, show you the things that you would normally see when you're rotating here, and try to give you a sense of um, what we're doing here and how we uh, go about teaching and, and what we can do. And I'll I'll make sure to rock the headset every single time. <laughs> well, tell you what, one thing I'm really really key on is keeping this under an hour. I hate these things that go for hours and hours and hours, and so I'll, I'll keep these things under an hour every single time. Um, so you don't have to worry about this dragging into the wee hours in the morning. But my star PGY3 has an Ian back when I see him on the screen wearing a tie. Yeah, straight sharp looking man. Um, <laughs> I'm going I'm to stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Perfect. And Sounds so good. I'm going to have Ian present a quick case and uh, we'll go from there. How about that? Right, so uh, again, we're at the, the organization, we're going to do a case and then I'm going to do a topic related to that case. Absolutely, guys. So um, thanks for Dr. to Dr. Wathme for introducing everything and about a little bit about our program. Um, again, I'm one of the PGY3 residents here at UVA. I'm excited to have you all here. Appreciate you guys tuning in and taking some time out of your um, busy lives. We know it's sort of a transition point for you. Um, so just a brief case presentation um, on thumoacetabular impingement. Um, and then uh, Dr. Rothman will give a little bit more detailed case on some of the specifics. Um, so to kick things off here, so this was a 32-year-old male who came into clinic for initial visit um, earlier this year. Um, chief complaint of right hip pain. This was sort of chronic going on for several years with no inciting event, uh, no trauma. Um, noted that certain activities exacerbated the pain. So deep flexion, sitting for long periods of time. I'm also standing for um, extended periods, um, caused some anterior groin pain. He had had an intraarticular um, hip injection that provided about 70% relief, um, which is a good sort of uh, diagnostic indicator, um, and traveled a lot for work, which required sitting for extended periods, um, again, leading to that anterior groin pain. So it's important um, when you see these patients to sort of get an idea of um, prior treatments or um, what sort of conservative management that they've um, managed to um, undertake before seeing them um, and consider surgical options. So as you see here, he has yes for pretty much all of the um, standard things that we do for conservative management um, for patients presenting this. So activity modification, oral inflammatories, physical therapy, again, sort of focusing on, um, you know, strengthening around the pelvis as well as orientation of the pelvis. 
um, and intraarticular injections, which you can have a lot of underlying etiology for patients who complain about hip pain. Um, so important to sort of um, diagnose with injections uh, from both uh, diagnostic and therapeutic standpoint um, to understand where the, the pain and etiology is coming from. So it was about a five out of 10 when he came in. Not a lot to present here, um, sort of an average um, height uh, male, um, uh, no acute distress, uh, non-intelligent gait. Um, and this is just sort of what our physical examination looks like for patients presenting with hip pain um, as we diagnose this sort of going through range of motion, strength, uh, tenderness uh, tests, as well as a good neurovascular exam to rule out um, spinal pathology. And we'll kind of go through these um, one at a time. So anytime we uh, see a patient looking at sort of capsular rebound, um, important, especially in post-op patients looking at sort of the integrity of the capsule um, and how much, and you can kind of see you take their toes externally uh, rotate and then let them bounce back in um, just to see if there's uh, any asymmetry between the two sides. Um, next, we do a log roll. Um, can be a very um, sensitive test, but non-specific for um, hip pathology. Again, seeing if there's any pain or uh, reproducible symptoms to um, their chief complaint and what they're um, uh, presenting for. Um, obviously, rolling uh, internally, externally rotating. You see the arrows there. So the stench field test, again, is, is another um, sensitive but not very specific test um, where you have the patient actively extend their knee um, and flex to the hip and you're providing a downward force um, as the examiner to see if there's any reproducible symptoms um, with this maneuver. It can also be um, things like hip flexor strain, um, but can be diagnostic for uh, intraarticular hip pathology, again, getting into flexion. Um, of course, range of motion, so hip flexion, looking at the angle that the thigh makes in relation to the um, trunk of the body there. Um, uh, external rotation, so again, keeping the knee stationary with the, um, the hip flex to 90 degrees and then bringing the uh, foot towards midline um, and then sort of drawing an imaginary line from the vertical to see what their external rotation is comparing to contralateral side and then internal rotation, obviously the opposite maneuver there. So FIDIR, which uh, stands for flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Um, is basically a maneuver where you're trying to reproduce again that deep squat um, flexion, you know, hip flexion that oftentimes the patients are sort of complaining about um, with sitting for extended period of time. So um, basically adducting the leg um, while you internally rotate um, and really flexing their hip up. And, all, and a lot of times this will reproduce that anterior groin pain um, that the patient's presenting with. So Faber um, is, is a test to look at um, sort of anterior capsular contracture. So um, you look at uh, obviously comparing to the contralateral side, um, how much they're able to sort of relax and let their um, lateral epicondyle come in relation to the bed. You can use your hand, as you see Dr. Gwathmi there, um, as sort of a marker um, and compare to the contralateral side to see if there's any aberrations there that might um, suggest some capsular pathology there um, from their underlying um, uh, femoral acetabular impingement. So again, just to sort of recap through his examination, a little bit of aberration um, and range of motion on the right side, which was his um, complaint side, uh, five out of five strength, uh, no tenderness to palpation, um, and then a positive uh, fidier test. So again, flexion, adduction, internal rotation on the right hand side, and a benign neurovascular exam. So we always get um, obviously imaging um, with this patient. This gentleman actually had some before he came in and we'll kind of walk through each one of these um, films that we get. So low AP pelvis here, um, and we'll sort of walk through some of the characteristics. So always want to look at joint space um, as well as making sure that it's appropriate AP. So again, um, the approximation of the coccyx to the uh, pubic symphysis, um, and then looking at uh, joint space. So is there any narrowing? Obviously looks pretty symmetrical here, no subchondral sclerosis. Um, and then the first thing I'll point out is the sort of crossover sign. So um, with this, you can see the anterior or red line uh, denoted in the picture um, is actually a lateral to the blue line, which is the posterior wall um, of the pelvis. And these lines ideally should not cross, which indicates um, that his uh, acentabulum is actually retroverted or turned posteriorly, um, which can contribute to some abnormal contact point between the femoral um, neck and the acentabulum. In addition to this, you see um, sort of outlined in red there, um, assist, it's hard to sort of denote with, um, with one view of uh, on an x-ray where this exists, but as we get into the MRI, we'll show you a little bit more, represents an impingement cyst. Um, so to sort of look at how much uh, coverage a patient has in their hip, um, this is our sort of objective measure. So lateral center edge angle, um, which is basically um, a vertical line drawn at the center point of a circle drawn around the femoral head, um, and then drawing, um, making an angle with that point to show um, how much coverage they have. So some, you can have dysplastic hips, so under coverage 
or over coverage, which again would lead um, further to that abnormal contact point there. Um, and he is just over sort of what we consider a normal level, which is about 40 um, for um, over coverage of um, bilateral hips. So this is um, actually more of a frog leg, but can suffice for a, a, a done lateral, which is if the patients are presenting to our clinic for the first time, what we get. And this helps kind of get in another angle on the femoral neck to um, isolate where the pathology typically exists for cam lesions. And you can see that his hips um, really superiorly um, uh, on the left-hand side and right-hand side are not nice and round like a soccer ball. So they're basically, um, as aptly named, a cam, which is sort of an eccentric point, um, and he doesn't really have a lot of head neck offset with that. You can also see between um, these two images, again, the basically um, divot that occurred as he goes into deep flexion where his acentabulum um, contacts his um, eccentric point on his uh, femoral neck. Um, in addition to this, we do have an objective measure as well, so alpha angle um, to sort of denote how, um, uh, how uh, abnormal the um, contour of their femoral head is, and again, to sort of get an idea of the head neck offset. Um, and this number should ideally be less than 55, so you can imagine as you shrink the angle, um, you have a more um, round femoral head. So again, draw the circle around the femoral head, um, and then you draw a, a line down the center of the femoral neck, and then a line out to where you actually lose um, that roundness. And as you um, basically make this um, angle smaller, you have a more round uh, femoral head, and so you can see his um, certainly is above that 55 number threshold. So just to go through a couple cuts of the MRI here, um, so you can see, you better appreciate um, how anterior and superior this um, impingement cyst that he has on his femoral neck is, um, right in the area of where that divot was um, that we saw on the plane films. Um, also in the top of the screen there, you can see a little bit of uh, chondral delamination as well as um, some abnorm uh, abnormalities of his labrum. So again, the little um, black triangle there that's at the uh, front of the femoral neck on the left-hand side, and again, the chondral delamination um, in the uh, top of the screen along the weight-bearing surface. So to sort of recap, again, this gentleman has both um, sort of subjective um, complaints that fit with um, FAI or an abnormal contact point between his femoral neck and acentabulum, um, and certainly pathology that's representative on his imaging and physical exam. So we elected to take him for labral repair um, and correction of his bony impingement. So this next slide is just to give you guys an idea of what the OR typically looks like um, before we go through the imaging. Again, we have a C-arm in the room, we have a perineal post, and then we pull traction with the boots. Um, and we get some pre-op imaging here to show what the um, hip looks like before we get started. Again, just the AP there. Um, and then you can see here um, the image on the upper right-hand corner of the screen um, showing what happens as we go from uh, 45 to approximately 90 degree done lateral. Um, and again, looking at that abnormal morphology um, of his uh, femoral neck. And you can see how the acentabulum ends up contacting that point on the femoral neck, um, tearing up his labrum and um, causing a lot of pain for him. So once we introduce the scope, um, you can see even before we turn on the water in the upper left-hand side, just how chewed up um, that labrum is. So multiple layers there, um, very angry looking. And then you see as we probe it um, in that middle picture, that large flap that exists there that's um, exquisitely painful for patients. Um, so certainly had a big lesion there. So um, as we prepare um, to repair the uh, torn labrum, uh, we use an RF probe to sort of um, get rid of the soft tissues that are present on the acentabulum. Again, this is looking at the ball of the hip. You can sort of see that radius of the femoral head on the upper left-hand corner. Um, and we prepare this surface um, to decrease some of the uh, pincer mechanism that's there, as well as um, to prepare for uh, anchor placement. And you can see the 5.5 millimeter diamond tip burr um, that we use to burr down um, to stable bone. Um, to then drill for our anchor placement. So you can see we pre-drilled actually a total of four anchors on the top. Um, and you can see us placing our anchors in the sutures around the labrum to repair it, um, reconstituting that nice um, circumferential um, labrum without arch flaps there. And we always probe to make sure um, that it's nice and stable. So then we turn our attention to basically the culprit of what caused the labral tear. So again, the femoral neck, you can see on the left-hand screen that large bulge there, um, sort of that abnormal contact point, and then the cyst that's developed that will unroof here shortly, um, as well as the aberrations in his femoral neck on the right-hand side, so very lumpy. Um, and then we get a, a 
pre-birth shot. So, so we know where our starting point is. We place our um, instruments in there and get a fluoro shot before we start burring. And then you can see here us, again, go, going from sort of a um, convex to a concave contour, um, unroofing that large impingement cyst and getting it down to a stable um, bone base so that it can remodel um, into healthy bone. Um, and again, this is kind of a lay of the land showing that uh, reconstituted labrum as well as uh, thermal neck and cyst. So this is the hip once it's reduced back in place, um, showing all that hard work. Um, this is just a shot of us repairing the capsule um, as we have to sort of violate that in order to get access to the joint. And these are just the before and after shots. So pre and post, left-hand side is pre. Um, and then you can see that nice contour, um, and nice head neck offset um, on the upper right-hand corner. Again, going into that 45 degree done lateral and then coming up into 90 degrees or um, just shy of it. Um, again, showing where that normal um, point would have been before and how um, wide open that is, especially in this image here. So you can almost see the contact point and you see how it's nice and wide open now. Um, and then just the AP. So this was his two week follow-up that he had early this week, um, just the AP pelvis. Um, again, you can sort of appreciate um, a little bit of the uh, cyst that's still there. Um, and this view here showing how much uh, we actually took away um, in order to um, clear up so that we um, get rid of the underlying etiology that caused his labral tear and pain in his hip. Questions. So I'm sure everybody in the audience is going to answer, ask a bunch of questions about FAI. I know that all y'all who um, are logged in are like, oh my God, UVA is going to kick it off with FAI. And uh, I'm <laughs> sorry about that. We could have probably done something a little bit more basic, but um, honestly, this is what I do. And I, was, I, I have the microphone tonight, so this is what we're going to talk about, okay? So, um, I'm going to share my screen now, um, and and I uh, I realize um, that I it's 8:31 right now. And I want to make sure I've told all my faculty to keep their their talks short and sweet. And here I have a talk that's probably not short or not sweet, but uh, it's hard. <laughs> There's just so much cool stuff about FAI. It's hard to get it down to 15 minutes or so. But I'll do my best. Ian, great job. It's really dark where you are, um, you. but hopefully this will brighten <laughs> this talk about FAI will really brighten your day. In the end, I Matt, I see you it. there. I might ask you a couple of questions. Who else is there? Max Auger, Alyssa Altoff. So, so get ready. Well, here goes nothing, okay? Um, so uh, I got to figure out how to work this in again. So I don't know how many disclosures I'll have into this talk, but I am a hip arthroscopist, so you might find that I'm a little obsessed about the hip. Uh, a, little, a quick housekeeping. I realize I should probably ought to do this uh, early. Um, there's my email. Um, David Craig's email is also really important. Um, he's our coordinator, and basically anything you need about UVA, go through him. We have a website that um, I try to keep pretty updated uh, as best I can. I think the residency portion of it is actually pretty helpful. We have a Twitter and an Instagram. The Twitter is run by the faculty or run by us, and the Instagram is run by the residents. So I guess if you really want to a deeper tour of UVA, follow us on Instagram. And Alyssa, I assume that's right. Just search UVA Ortho, I'm sure you'll find it. So Alyssa Altoff runs that uh, Instagram account. So um, I think before we go too into detail about FAI, we gotta talk about the hip labrum because in my clinic, the labrum is like LeBron James. It gets all the press. And this is my average patient. I got a labral tear, I gotta get it fixed. Oh my God, I gotta get it fixed. And so that's what I have to deal with every single day. And I've seen plenty of athletes have their athletic career ended by a labral tear in the hip. So what is a labrum? You know, I try to explain it to patients all the time. It's a gasket seal around the hip joint. It's like a liner, helps the cushion or seal the joint. But it's really hard to, to help describe it to a patient. And so I think we should probably dig a little deeper since we're all doctors here. The anatomy of it's this ring of fiber cartilage attached to the acetabular rim that, that is very variable as far as its size. And there's different hips that have larger labrums and, and smaller labrums, but ultimately a lot of variability. It's contiguous to the articular surface and the peripheral blood supply and dense innervation is really important as far as how it functions. Also important as far as how it heals and why it hurts when you tear it. So it helps to distribute load. It increases the volume of the acetabulum by up to a third. It also seals the joint. I think the coolest thing about the hip labrum is that it creates an interarticular fluid gradient between the femoral head and the acetabulum that allows the, the hip to move fluidly within it. And so by sealing the joint, it creates this constant working space. And so when you see videos like this, and hopefully this plays okay, I know that Zoom doesn't do videos real well. And so I, I, uh, I don't expect you're gonna see this perfectly, but you can see how it creates this really 
this, this suction seal, this vacuum, and when it's violated, it no longer creates that suction seal. So why does a labrum tear? The labrum is this soft structure, the soft interface between two hard structures, the femur and the acetabulum. And so it can either be pinched between the two hard surfaces and tear that way. It sometimes will rip from repetitive shear because the hip was unstable, or sometimes it just flat out wears out like an arthritis. And so anybody who has arthritis has a hip labral tear by definition. So here again is my hip patient. I have an MRI. I don't need x-rays. I know I have a labral tear. Why are you getting x-rays? The reason why x-rays matter is because this is kind of how I, I look at it. The MRI is like a Google Images, like street view of, U, of UVA hospital. It's, it's like you're on the street. And it's really hard to get context. Whereas the x-ray is more like the map of Virginia. And so when you see this MRI showing a labral tear, it's important to realize this is an dysplastic hip. And so the x-rays provide that context. And, and, and what you'll find throughout the rest of this talk, I hardly ever talk about MRIs because honestly, FAI and dysplasia ends up being an x-ray type of diagnosis. So here are some MRI reads that I've gotten over my clinic in the past year or so. You know, you have a tear of the acetabular label, blah, 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 blah. But when you actually look at these tears, you realize they're all very, very, very different tears. And that's because the hips they're, they're associated with. So on the top left, you have dysplasia. On the top right, you have impingement. Uh, on the bottom left, you have an unstable hip with a really hyp hypoplastic labrum. On the bottom right, you have early arthritis, but labrum is kind of wearing out. So the x-ray ends up being the key to the diagnosis of labral pathology, okay? And so these are the patients who are attached to those images. And again, a, and a, and to appropriately manage the labrum in these patients, you have to be able to understand the etiology of the damage. So hips come in all shapes and sizes. The variability in hip morphology is crazy. Sometimes the socket is shallow. Sometimes the socket is deep. Sometimes the femoral head is round, and sometimes it's just not round. We call this morphology. I don't like to use the term deformity because that implies there's some type of thing wrong with the hip. We'll use the term morphology. And you end up having really two ends of the, the spectrum. Dysplasia are too tight in the left side and impingement are too tight in the right side, okay? But that's probably too simplistic. There's a lot of variability in between them and you also can have both at the same time. So here's just kind of an x-ray depiction of instability versus impingement. So you see in the impingement situation, the hip is too deep, the labrum is gonna get pinched. Whereas in the instability situation, the labrum is basically trying to hold on for dear life. So I like to look at it like a loose fitting pair of shoes versus the, the, uh, the sheep stuck between the two rocks. My daughter loves that picture for some reason. She thinks it's so funny. So again, the shallow socket dysplasia, what ends up happening is the ball tries to slide out of the socket, the labrum can't hold it. And you get this classic lateral shear pattern where you end up tearing the labrum off the side of your hip. With dysplasia, you have inadequate foundation leading to instability. And so this is an unstable situation and you have to be very careful how you treat the labrum because if you try to repair this labrum, you might end up causing it a problem. So here's a dysplastic hip, and the, and the treatment for this hip is a PAO, or periastabular osteotomy. But that brings me to the topic that I really want to talk about. And I uh, see Quan John Kui on the, uh, on the line. He's the guy who actually told me about this topic in the first place when I was a PGY2 resident. I thought it was kind of silly because um, you know, FAI. But honestly, this is really the only reason why hip arthroscopists were put on this earth, in my opinion. So, so FAI, what is FAI? Really what FAI is, is a square peg in a round hole phenomenon. And I think that Dr. Backlund, when we went through his case, kind of gave you a sense of, oh, that ball and socket just didn't fit together very well. So I want to give a quick shout out to Bobby Chabra. I see he just joined us. And so um, it's going to be very hard for him to uh, listen to all this hip stuff. So I'm going to pause for a second in case he wants to say hello. So I don't want him to be bored by the end of this. Do you want to say hello, Bobby? So you have, uh, we have 18 students logged in. And yeah, I do. Um, yeah. Thanks uh, for organizing this. Uh, great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound fine. Okay, good. Um, and remember, Winston, I'm the one that made you uh, become a hip arthroscopist if you wanted a job here. So... Uh, I can I can put up with listening to uh, this uh, talk. That's why I lost all my hair. Yes, exactly. Well, one, um, I want to thank everyone for participating. Of course, want to thank uh, Dr. Guathme and all our residents uh, for uh, uh, in being involved uh, with this and many of our faculty. 
Um, sorry I missed the uh, introduction, but uh, I got stuck on a call. Uh, but I want to welcome all of you to uh, UVA Orthopedics virtually. Uh, excited to have you as part of our virtual curriculum. This is a, a new thing for us as, as it is for everyone. Uh, but I hope you uh, have the opportunity to learn about our program over the next several weeks. I'm excited to give a talk later on. I'm excited to showcase uh, Ivy Mountain, our new orthopedic center that's under construction that Dr. Guacamole may have mentioned earlier. Um, but this is a wonderful program uh, with a great commitment to education. And uh, I'm excited to have uh, all of you uh, um, meet all of you this way. Uh, it's not ideal, but it's the best uh, we can do right now. But um, I, I think you'll learn a tremendous amount from the curriculum that Dr. Guacamole has put together. And uh, Please let us know uh, what you think and what we can do better as this curriculum, as, as you uh, experience this, uh, uh, the, the, the topics that we're covering. And, and also don't hesitate to ask us questions about the program and learn as much as you can in, in, through this manner. Uh, uh, and we want to make sure we provide as much information so uh, you get the experience that you would have had if you had rotated here. So uh, welcome. and. Uh, uh, thanks for participating. And again, th thanks, Dr. Guafme. And I'll let everyone get back to FAI. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chabra. So I guess I want to reiterate that I'm here at UVA because of Bobby Chabra, not because he gave me a job, because I wanted to come back and work with him. Um, he was my uh, my faculty when I was a resident here. And, and honestly, when you have somebody got like that leading the charge, you know you're in a good place. And that's what makes me sad about this whole uh, situation here is that if you guys came to UVA and rotated, you just kind of get a sense of just how um, just how much uh, momentum and how much excitement we have around orthopedics here. And that excitement brings me back to FAI because of all the topics we're going to talk about, this is probably going to be the best one. So again, two basic types. We have pincer or rim impingement and cam. And so pincer impingement is basically a low hanging uh, rim in the front of your hip. And this rider truck can't get through this uh, through this bridge because it's low hanging rim. What ends up happening as your hip comes into flexion, it will strike this rim, pinch the labrum, and lever the hip out of the socket. And so a really classic pattern of both labral damage, femoral neck damage, and a contra coup injury in the back of the joint where it levered against. And so you'll see these bruised labrums, these herniation pits like Ian showed during his case, and this cartilage damage in the back of the hip. And so the next one would be the cam type mechanism. And I love this GIF or GIF, whatever you guys call it these days, where it shows this, this uh, duck where the, where the thing is rotating, lifting the wing up. This is where the cam, the term cam comes from. And this is what it looks like in a hip. And the mechanism is that when that big out of round area of the hip strikes the, the acetabulum, it levers the hip out of the socket and tears the cartilage. So here's a, a, a representation of a not round ball. As you can see, when it comes up into the socket, it starts to carve that cartilage out. And even in really young people, you can get these severe cartilage delamination situations. And here's what it looks like. This is a 19-year-old baseball player we scoped. Uh, you can see the large can deformity on the femoral head neck junction. Um, and also you can see this instability. And, and hopefully this video will play. You can see it, but this is just a fluoro shot of a, of a case we had. And you can see that when, you, when the hip comes into deep flexion, the neck will actually will strike the um, the neck will actually strike the femoral uh, the acetabulum and lever the ball out of the socket. So people can sense instability with this. Okay. And so I think that when you're trying to look at FAI, it's important to be able to analyze it on X-ray. It ends up, ends up being a really important key to this. And Ian did a great job of going through the X-rays with you. I think anybody who wants to treat young hips should read John Clausey's paper from 2008 in JBGS where he just basically goes to an entire approach to the young adult hip. And so I've used this to kind of make my plain radiographic series. I'll get an AP pelvis. I'll get done laterals of, of both sides. Actually, I'll get bilateral done laterals in this false profile. And so what I'm looking for on the AP pelvis that Ian went through in such great detail is I wanna make sure that the anterior rim and posterior rim come together at the very lateral edge of the source seal. If, if you have a crossover sign that tends to mean the anterior rim's hanging too low, like that rider truck, and it's going to cause labral damage. So they call it the crossover sign as Ian articulated. The source seal is going to be the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum. Source seal in French means eyebrow, and so that's the eyebrows of your hip, and that's the weight-bearing dome. 
The AIIS is going to be the anterior inferior iliac spine. It can also cause impingement. And finally, the ischial spine, which is important to look at when you're trying to assess retroversion of the acetabulum. So again, here's the crossover sign. And you got to be careful with this because different projections of the pelvis can give you an artificial crossover sign. But when you see the anterior rim hanging below the posterior rim, you start to worry that perhaps this hip's going to impinge in the front. So um, I don't know if you guys have seen this picture. I think it's hilarious. This is uh, Prince William giving his thoughts on the importance of orthogonal views. Looks like he might be using the middle finger, but in fact, he has all three fingers showing. Because, so it's important to get both views of the hip when you're trying to treat this. And so the view that I get is a 45 degree done lateral. And the reason why I like a done lateral because it gives you an elongated view of the femoral head neck junction and allows you really to analyze that problem area in the femoral neck, okay? So you're looking here for herniation pits, for loss of femoral head neck offset, and for that cam deformity. So you try to characterize the bump. And this is kind of funny about FAI because for years we just thought these are normal x-rays. But when you start to look at it more closely, you see this ridge right here, and you realize that ridge is some remodeling where the femoral head neck junction is, is striking the acetabulum. Uh, some people call this a dromedary sign after the camel. Um, also important to look for impingement cysts like Dr. Backlund showed in his case, because this is where they're going to show up, okay? The alpha angle is, is going to be what the, uh, the objective view of how a uh, cam deformity is, looking for, a, for less than 55, or actually less than 50. Insurance companies really want this to be greater than 55 for, to authorize a, uh, authorize a surgery. Uh, it's important to realize that cams come in many, many shapes, okay? So it can have lack of offset or a true cam deformity. And so all of these are cam deformities in their, own, in, their own, in their own way. So you can have really one of two different, I'd say, uh, areas. You either have inadequate head neck offset where the ball just sort of loses its roundness over time, or you actually have a prominent bump. We actually have a high spot on the femoral neck that can start to strike the acetabulum. Also important to realize that cams can come in many locations. You can hear, see here is one that's in the back as well. The false profile is great for showing anterior coverage. And so you can kind of see the spectrum of anterior coverage. You can have a really shallow uh, socket like you have here on the left, or really deep socket like you have there on the right. Um, and on the right, that's an area of impingement. On the left, you have a dysplastic hip. Um, so I like that for the x-ray to tell the story. I don't know what story this x-ray is telling, but it's telling some story about a key. Um, so look at this hip here, and I think it's a really great x-ray because there's a couple of things in this x-ray I want you to be able to point out. Um, one, the acetabulum looks blunted, like almost like uh, something is, is, is uh, striking it. And two, there's a little divot there in the femoral neck. And if you can actually move this hip around, you kind of get a sense the femoral neck is striking the acetabulum right there. And whatever's in between there is getting crushed. And that's where the labrum will tear in this case. And so important to realize the labrum can tear uh, from pinching, okay? In this case, you have a shallow hip. So the hip is not really covered at all. And you have to imagine that poor labrum is doing its, its best to hold that hip in place. And so the sheer forces across that labrum are gonna be compromised and over time, and it's gonna to wanna to slide out and tear that labrum. Really key to recognize this because this is one that you really can't treat orthoscopically. And finally, here's a great cam deformity. You can really get a picture of how that structure there is gonna cause a problem to get something to the joint. And so these, as you can see under fluoro, as you flex the hip, it actually levers out the socket and creates this delamination situation. So it's really key to let the x-ray tell the story. So when it comes down to hip damage, what it really comes down to is your morphology or the shape of your hip combined with whatever activities you're doing will lead to symptomatic damage, okay? Um, important to also recognize that, that FAA morphology can be pretty ubiquitous, and so make sure you treat the patient and not your x-ray because you'll find that if you x-ray every single person on the team, a lot of them will have deformities and not have problems with it because they've been able to compensate or adjust their mechanics in such a way they're not creating damage. So in summary, I don't know, I know Matt DC is a big basketball fan. Do you know who that is in the picture there, Matt DC? Let's see. That's Isaiah Thomas, the lesser. So the lesser. And Amon Shumpert. And um, there you go, Kaluan Cavaliers in the oh. back. Why am I showing Isaiah Thomas, Matt DC? Because he uh, had labral issues that derailed his uh, high scoring Celtic career. Yeah, he, he pretty much just basically played through FAI, destroyed his hip. And he was basically set up for a max contract and he's never really been the same. He actually had to have surgery for it, but it was probably too late at that point. 
So in summary, yeah, Winston, the lab- Winston, Winston, remember the Washington Wizards picked him up post surgery. I'm aware of that. I, I have pictures of him on the Wizards, but it's too, it's too, they're too sad to show. Yeah, well, you know me, a DC DC sports fan and DC boy. The, the Wizards will take anyone, obviously. <laughs> they didn't want me. <laughs> I'm so glad Bobby, Dr. Chopper's paying attention. So in summary, the labrum shares the load, it seals the joint, it helps to provide stability and proprioception. Uh, tears of labrum are almost always the result of some type of bony abnormality, um, either dysplasia or FAI or some type of bony abnormality. The morphology of the hip, the structure that was highly variable. Um, and FAI ends up being a leading cause of labral degeneration and uh, joint damage. The two main types are going to be pincer and cam, although very often you have both at the same time. And really a careful analysis of the plane radiographs is fundamental understanding FAI. Finally, if you have this abnormal hip shape combined with excessive physical activity, that's what really leads to joint damage. That's why people like Isaiah Thomas, Andy Murray, and Alex Rodriguez have gotten themselves into trouble over, over time. So I could talk about FAI for years. I'm gonna, I try to keep it pretty short. Um, do you have, are there any questions from the audience? I know this is the first night. And what I gotta figure out is how to make this interactive. And I'm, what I might do is I might reach out to all of you and see if you guys can give me some ideas how to make it interactive. Um, I, uh, at the end of each presentation going forward, we are gonna have sort of a faculty discussion, a faculty panel that I'm gonna moderate and try to generate some conversation amongst our faculty and residents. Um, but if anybody wants to put into the chat a question, that'd be fine. Otherwise, I'm going to quiz my residents. Dr. Backlund, you're probably off the hook. You did a pretty good job. Um, but Matt DC, he is just that. right. He is just right for cases um, because he's going into sports, and you know maybe one day he'll be a hip arthroscopist, tortured like me, and lose all of his hair. All right. So Matt, we do a case with me real quick. And the thing about these cases, there's really nothing except for just the x-rays. So I'm going to give you this 37-year-old male. And I think a lot of, I just want to tell the students in the audience, a lot of orthopedics is language and how you speak and how you describe things and whether or not you, you can learn the flu, to become fluent in the language of orthopedics. And so the most basic thing in orthopedics is describing an x-ray. And so Matt Deasy is a PGY4 resident. He's got a good vocabulary. You know, he uses monosyllabic and, and polysyllabic words. What do you see here? This is a 37-year-old who presented with, with right hip pain, reduced range of motion, inability to flex or abductor, abduct his hip. What do you think you see here, Matt? So I'll, I'll give you a warning. They're doing some construction around the call room, so it may be difficult at times. I don't know if you can hear that. How, can, how convenient. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, so I see an AP and what looks like uh, done lateral of uh, – the so an AP pelvis and done lateral the right hip of this 37 year old gentleman um, showing some moderate joint space narrowing um, with some increased lateral coverage of the right hip and on the lateral x-ray I see what looks to be sort of the dromedary sign you discussed earlier um, evidence uh, of impingement on the femoral neck on the right. I love it that's a great description of this um, I also just want to point out I mean this is a very very loudly projecting acetabulum um, some people think that the labrum over time can ossify or harden, and as it hardens, it can actually cause acquired pincer deformity where you have, um, you know, labrum that basically turns, uh, turns to bone and creates more pincer. I see some of my faculty, Dr. Dr. Queer, if you're out there, would you replace this hip? This guy is 37 years old. What do you think? If you're not out there, it's completely fine. I see, I see your beautiful face out there, so I figured I'd give you a chance. All right. So, um, and also I see a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll get to. So this is what looks like inside the joint. And I think it's really key. So these are kind of the pictures of what this labrum looks like. You, you guys on the call probably haven't seen the normal labrum at all, but this is a, a labrum that's almost completely turned to bone. And over time it's created this giant groove in the, in the uh, femoral head and created a ton of pain and pinching. And so the goal for surgery in this person is twofold. One, to remove the impinging features of this hip and two, to repair whatever soft tissue structure that I can. And so what we end up doing here, there's a before and after picture where we've taken that rim and try to get the crossover sign to normalize here at the, at the lateral of the acetabulum and also take down the femoral neck to make it as smooth as possible. And so this person's uh, flexion improved, his abduction improved, and his symptoms improved big time. 
they were able to keep out the adult reconstruction clinic for at least another couple of years. It's important to realize that, that Matt was really good at, at identifying. He probably does have some joint space narrowing. This guy is on the road to arthritis, but I really think this can be a really improved hip joint over time. Um, I've heard that we've got some, some questions in the chat, so let's see what we got here. Question from, let's see, we'll go from the top. Uh, so Christian, Christian, um, Christian's from Ohio State. Uh, just heard, I guess Ohio State, uh, their football program, it just, I heard that the, the practice is, is no longer on. Now the Big Ten's not going to even play people outside their conference. Crazy stuff going on with COVID. So given the FAI has altered and into many athletes' careers, what directions do you see heading an attempt to save athletic careers? My answer there, Christian, is that I think we need to recognize this earlier and start to realize that our, that our football players who have re reduced internal rotation and flexion on their preseason physicals should probably be screened for FAI. They call CAM FAI the silent killer of the hip. What it does is it carves out your cartilage, and your cartilage has as, as many nerve fibers in it as your hair does. And so once I shave my head, I don't really feel that. And once you lose cartilage, you don't feel that until you start tearing your labrum or start having subchondral uh, problems as well. And so what I would probably say as far as how do you treat FAI in athletes is recognize it earlier. FAI is very young. It's, it was first described in 2003 by Reinhold Gans, who was a, a Swiss um, orthopedist who saw a lot of total hip replacements in young people and looking at the morphology of their hips, realized they had this deformity called FAI. And so in 2003, he made a very, very good discovery um, and wrote a, a paper that's in core. And I'd encourage all of you guys to look it up um, about FAI in the hip. Um, and so, uh, so what we re realize is FAI causes arthritis and the earlier you catch it, the better you do. I'm pretty sure the Dr. Chopper has got some bottles of scotch in his cabinet that are older than FAI, as crazy as that might sound. From uh, Rob Turk, uh, Rob asks, um, you mentioned that some patients compensate, don't have pain even with the deformity. How or in what ways have you seen this compensation manifest? And so the key to FAI is this. Um, everybody's got different structures in their hip. They're, everybody's hip looks a little bit different, okay? And some people, for whatever reason, they're able to, to hold their pelvis in a position or their lumbar spine um, in a way that the actual morphology is not going to give them trouble. I had the opportunity to examine um, the Boston Bruins hockey team, and every single one of them has no internal rotation in their hip. And I think to some degree, the lack of motion is being protective because their cam lesion can't actually even get into their hip to cause the problem in the first place. And so, um, so if you x-rayed an entire soccer team or field hockey team or lacrosse team, you'd probably see 60 or 70% would have FAI morphology. And maybe only one or two would have a symptom over the course of their career. And so you do have to realize that this is, is going to be present in asymptomatic populations and not just treat x-ray, but treat the people. Um, Paul from UVA asked me, is there the diagnosis of conjugal injury a diagnosis of exclusion? Um, the article was talking about how arthroscopy is the best way to treat conjugal injuries. So cartilage is very poorly identified on, on, on MRI. Uh, MRI really under caused cartilage damage. The hip is so tightly co-opted that it's very hard for the, the joint to separate to actually see signal from the cartilage. There's new cartilage sequences like degemeric which can help to identify and elucidate cartilage damage. But ultimately, if you see a big can deformity, you expect cartilage damage. Um, so again, FAI ends up being really important um, to identify the, the potential reason for it. So we've got lots of questions. Here we go. Um, Backlund showed a case. This is from Josh Schwartz, EDMS, my alma mater. Um, FAI and mixed can pincer etiology. Uh, is there a reason uh, the standalone pincer morphology is significantly less likely to spike mixed etiology, almost equivalent to standalone CAM morphology. So you're asking about the demographics of, of pincer and CAM. Um, I think it's, a lot of it's just kind of how you're defining it. Um, you know, a lot of people have a pincer deformity that's not really identified. In fact, most people who are scoping a lot of hips kind of underplay the pincer cause of it, and we're doing most of our work on the, on the, uh, femoral, on the femoral neck side. Um, because you can actually get a lot of, look at this picture here. You know, if I had just done a femoral neck, you probably would have had a lot of improved motion. I took the, the rim down because I thought that was a, a capturing his hip, but um, the cam deformity ends up being a, a, probably the biggest problem that creates more problems. Um, in general, I think most commonly you'll see some degree of mixed. Um, and I think if you're going to try and look at the actual demographics of it, it's highly variable based on what paper you're going to be looking at. In my mind, cam deformities are kind of male deformities and pincers are more or less seen in women, uh, but that's not quite as, uh, 
I don't want to be too general in that in that determination because uh, women can have can deformities. Women will tend to have much smaller can deformities, and create a lot bigger problem because they have a lot more motion and chilling to their joint. Uh, and finally, um, Christian's asking if the prophylactic surgery would be recommended. I, and I hardly, if you don't have symptoms, I tend not to do anything because uh, I can't make a, a, an asymptomatic hip better than what it currently is. Now, as soon as the symptoms occur, that's when we start getting into the hip and start doing stuff. Um, so there's all the questions I have for now. Again, I, I'm adamant about keeping this under an hour. I don't want to put anybody to sleep. We're right at 8.59. Let's do one more case just because I love doing cases, and I, and I want to get um, someone else involved here. Matt, you did a great job. You're off the hook. Who's up there? Any of my residents want to volunteer to do a case? Let's see what kind of action we have. Alyssa? Max? Ask Michelle, Alyssa. Who's Michelle here? Another star, James Burgess. Or does any student want to take take any student want to just jump on here and start talking X-rays? Man, crickets! I put everybody to sleep. That's so sad. Alyssa, I just saw Alyssa unmute herself. What do you got here, Alyssa? Oh, I just unmuted myself. Okay, so this was is that an accident? Because now you're in trouble. <laughs> no. So this is 23 year old male. This is an AP pelvis and a done lateral. I see a cam deformity on the right. Where are his symptoms? On the right or the left? The right, sorry, I probably should give you more. The 23 year old man who has right hip pain, um, a reduced range of motion, pretty much all FAI has got a similar presentation. Okay, so on the right side, I see a cam deformity. I kind of see the femoral head that's uncovered from the acetabulum, and I can appreciate that on the lateral as well, um, especially with the cam deformity. Yeah, so this is a lo loss of offset. And also, I mean, this is something we didn't really talk about, but his anterior inferior iliac spine is hanging really, really low as well. And sometimes that can create some pinching as well. So this is a 23-year-old kid, feel like a sort of treatment. So again, we take in the surgery. And the reason why I want to show you guys these cases, because I want to show you what this does inside the hip. So the picture here on the left is a just a labrum and a 23-year-old male that's just destroyed. Um, this detached from the bone, you have chondral delamination. The picture to the right of that, that's a burr, and what we're gonna, that's the, the pincer, that's the acetabular rim. The limb we've actually taken off the rim so we can take that rim down. And so here's the, uh, here's the femoral side, we have that large can deformity. And again, ultimately the best thing about FAI cases is you get to see your before and after x-rays. And so what you'll see here, as you can see, we've, we've rounded out this femoral head neck junction, try to make it as circular as possible, make it look like more like a soccer ball. It's subtle, but you can also see we've taken back that AIIS a little bit to give a little bit less AIIS impingement or subspine impingement with the goal of giving a little more breathing room. So we're trying to change the actual mechanics of these hip joints, okay? Um, and I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop there. It's 9.02. Um, that was a lot of fun. I'm sure that everybody didn't think it was really as fun as me. Um, Winston, you know, Winston, can I have a question? Oh, Dr. Yeah. Quay, you are here. Have a question. Well, I, I heard you talking about I got you into... Uh, this topic actually when you were a PGY2. Yeah. That, that's true. And as continue, you know, this is a major reason causing osteoarthritis. And I know you will have a lot of failure with uh, osteoscopic surgery. So I have to take, take care of it anyway. Oh, come on, Trev. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, uh, again, thank you for this outstanding program. And I also want to thank, you know, other uh, medical students from other institutions for joining us to, you know, to know more about UVA. So, you know, this case is very interesting, actually. Um, you know, I, I think today, actually, I asked uh, Lisa talking about uh, uh, the posterior wall sign. If you, you got an AP x-ray over here, put a dot in the center of the femur head, and uh, <clears throat> you will see uh, the posterior wall as medial to the center of the femur head. So uh, apparently you have a retroverted acetabulum and uh, it's kind of a shallow. So this is uh, almost you have some characteristic of uh, DDH. So I know you will probably debrid the, you know, the, the injured labrum and uh, correct that a pincer deformity and a cam also. But still this hip can, you know, is high risk for instability later on. I don't know if you see that. Yes. Uh, in, your, in your case, uh, in, in your practice. Trey, that's like, that's like FAI 501. So what Trey is describing is he's describing 
of posterior dysplasia, which what ends up happening is the femoral, the acetabulum can be oriented and it's normally oriented in some antiversion. And when you start seeing what he's describing as a posterior wall sign, which what you're seeing is you're seeing the posterior wall medial to the center of rotation of the femoral head. This is actually a hypovolemic acetabulum, meaning it's kind of shallow in the back. And so you got to be careful about is making it a truly dysplastic it by taking out too much of the rim, especially in the front. And so, yes, I do see that tray a lot. Um, there are people who are doing periastabular osteotomies for that to try to correct that orientation. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think that we can treat a lot of the impend like for instance, in this case here, the guy's got such a big cam deformity. And I think that if we can improve the femoral head and neck offset, he won't, he won't leave her quite so much in the front and pop out the back. And so I do think you can improve instability by addressing the anterior impingement and not have to worry about the posterior wall quite so much. But your point is very well taken and that there's some people who have a really, really, really deficient posterior wall. You gotta be really careful about doing some type of anterior work for because you're gonna make them unstable. But again, I was trying to keep this talk as uh, you know, ortho 101 and you're kind of getting into the uh, into the higher level of discussion. Uh, too too that. deep, yeah, sorry for the delay. <laughs> Trey, Trey, you are the reason why I knew what I know about hips because you gave a talk back. You just came back from you, you were with Gons, right? You were you actually went and trained with Reinhold Gons. That's right. And so you came back and brought all this new knowledge to UVA that I had never even heard of before. And honestly, I thought it was a little bit crazy, but here I am, the crazy guy now. Right. That's the time when uh, you know East Coast are just a provisi. And yeah. uh, me, you know, we we uh, we we were working on it. We started this, so I know. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, and uh, really, you solve a lot of problems. So they don't need a total hip replacement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, thank you yeah. for that input, Trey. I do appreciate. It. That's the beauty well, of of academic medicine is just the, the just the, the discussion with different types of attendings and, and residents, and, and the fact that Alyssa was talking with Dr. Kui about this today, and now she's presenting this case tonight. So. Awesome stuff. All right, it's not a six. I, I violated my first principle, which keep it under an hour. So I'm not going to go much further on this. But I will send a follow-up email to everybody tonight to kind of get a sense of if this is a good program, if you guys have any adjustments you want to do. And also, I really, I really want to get some feedback on how to make this interactive for the students. Because what I really want to do is get you guys involved and get you guys talking so we can kind of have some interaction. Next week, we'll be talking about ACL tears with Mark Miller. Um, he is my senior partner, probably knows more about ACLs than anybody that I know. Um, Dr. Bachman's telling me there's a couple more questions in the chat. I'll answer your questions offline, actually, if that's okay. Um, that way we can get everybody done. Uh, but Dr. Mark Miller will be doing ACL tears um, next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to have the entire sports faculty. I'm going to start quizzing Dr. Duck and Dr. Warner and Dr. Brockmeyer. So, um, I hope all of you guys enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys next week, okay? Anything else from the crowd? All right, again, this will be available under, under as a recording. I'll send the recording out to everybody who's registered. If you're on this call and you, did, you didn't see your name on that list, will you email me so that I can put you onto the list, okay? Otherwise, we won't get any further communications about this thing. All right, guys. You all have a great night, okay? <laughs>